We're continuing this sermon series on what is called the Shema. Shema means hear or listen in the Hebrew language. Moses told Israel that they were to hear, they were to Shema, that the Lord, their God, was to be loved with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their strength. Jesus knew the Shema. Jesus would have prayed the Shema twice a day like any devout Jew prayed and continues to do. And Jesus taught the Shema as well. And when Jesus taught it, he added another part of the Bible with it. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is the Shema, to love God with all we are. But he said there's a second commandment that goes with it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are a lot of other good things in the Jewish law Jesus could have added. Uh, a lot of things he could have quoted. But he gives this one. Love your neighbor. And by adding love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus teaches that the same form of love for God is the same form of love we should have for our neighbor. We love God with all that we are when we love our neighbor. Disciples are not to apply a different love or a lesser love than to the love we give to God. Think about that. Which really torques me. Because, you know, I can convince myself that I'm loving God uh, when I come to church and when I pray and when I read my Bible and, and you, you know, I don't know, write sermons. But then I have to deal with others. Uh, particularly those that bother me or they're not up to my standards or who are in a path when I'm beelining it to something really important I got to do or who may, I may not feel comfortable with. And then I'm told, well, this is the measure of my love for God. Well, that just deflates all my grand images of how spiritual I am and how Christian I am. You mean, Jesus, I got to love these people too? Can't it just be between you and me? Can't it just be you and me? Other people too? Uh, Mark Laberton, a pastor, wrote a book called The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor. And he said, if we say we love God and we don't love our neighbor, it turns out we don't love God. In other words, our faith is only fiction. Uh, Teresa of Avila was a, uh, she's considered a saint in the Catholic Church. She lived in the 1500s. She was a great woman of prayer, great uh, a mystic, if you would, and people still read her writings today and find them that they help them uh, lead to God. Uh, but she said this, she says, we can't always be sure whether we're loving God, although we might have good reasons to believe that we are, but we can always know quite sure whether we're loving our neighbor. In other words, if you're not sure whether you're really loving God, just look at how you're loving those around you. Which brings us to a time when an expert in the law came to Jesus to test him, a lawyer. How do you feel about lawyers? We love you, Andy. Andy, we love you. We do. I know, it's, it's all those other lawyers. And so I'm gonna tell a lawyer joke, is that okay? So there's a rabbi, a Hindu, and a lawyer, okay? And they're driving together. And uh, they're in the countryside one evening and their car breaks down and, and they walk to a nearby, I don't know why a rabbi and a Hindu and a lawyer would even be in the same car, but anyway. And they walk to the farm and the farmer tells him, you know, it's, it's too late to get a tow truck. And, and all he's got is two, two beds in his house, but then there's the barn. So two can sleep in the beds, one's got to go in the barn. Well, the Hindu raises his hand. He says, you know, I'm humble. I will go sleep in the barn. And so he does. And just a few minutes later, he knocks on the door and he says, I can't sleep in the barn. There's a cow in, in the barn and, and, and I can't sleep in the same building as a cow. I'm Hindu. Okay. Well, the rabbi says, um, 
it's okay, I'll sleep in the barn. And soon he's back knocking on the door and he says, I, I can't sleep in the barn. There's a pig in the barn. And uh, the lawyer says, okay, I'll go sleep in the barn. And pretty soon there's a knock at the door and the farmer sighs and he answers it and it's the pig and the cow. <laughs> We love you, Andy. <laughs> but this lawyer walks up to Jesus to test him. And the lawyer that, that is being spoken of is, is a lawyer in the Jewish law, an expert in the Jewish law. When you read about lawyers in the Gospels, that's, that's what they do. They, they, they understand the legalities of the Jewish law, expert in the Bible. People rely on them to know the meaning of the Bible. And this lawyer doesn't want to know how to pray. He doesn't ask Jesus how to be more faithful to God. It says that he's trying to test him. And he asked Jesus how he can gain eternal life. Not really to know, not, not really wanting to know how he gets eternal life, but he, again, he wants to trip Jesus up on something. And Jesus says, well, how do you read the Bible? And, and the lawyer quotes the Shema. Well, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Um, if you notice, Deuteronomy 6 actually has heart, soul, and strength. Um, the lawyer gets one more piece of us in there where he adds mind. And then he also quotes Leviticus 19.18. And he says, we're also to love our neighbor as ourself. And maybe he'd heard Jesus add this part about loving your neighbor as well, or, or maybe it was often cited by Bible teachers of the law, but he puts both of these together, and Jesus applauds him and says, you got the right answer. You're exactly right. You do these things, and you're on the right track. But the lawyer couldn't stop there. No, it says he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make himself look good. He wanted to make himself look smart. He wanted to find a loophole, maybe. Maybe make himself look better than Jesus. So he says, well, who's my neighbor exactly? How far do I have to go? Where are the limits? And Jesus answers by telling that well-known parable of the Samaritan. Did you know that's where the parable comes from? It comes from a lawyer testing Jesus about the Shema. It's a parable we've heard many times. I am sure many a sermon has been preached from this pulpit in this room on this parable over the 146 years of this church. I have no doubt. And it's a parable perhaps we think we know better than we do. It is a parable spoken in response of what it means to love our neighbor. And it goes like this. A man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he's mugged. And he's robbed and he's left for dead. And the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a well-known road. Um, it's really not even a road. It's, it's like a dirt trail. I've been on this road. And it is dangerous because there are caverns and there are caves all around. Very easy for uh, thieves or bandits to hide or to take advantage of, of, of whoever they're going to attack their prey without anybody seeing them. And this man is lying on the road beaten and bloodied and vulnerable. And three people come along. The first two are Jewish, religious leaders, people of faith, and they keep their distance and they walk around the hurting man. But the third person is a Samaritan. And that's the edgy part of this teaching, really. That's where the edge is. Because in Jesus' time, a neighbor... If you said neighbor, that only referred to Jewish people, not Gentiles. That's how people thought. There was just a deep prejudice against those who were not of the people, who were not of the religion, who were not of the faith of Israel. Samaritans were definitely not neighbors. They were social, political, and religious adversaries of Israel. Just before Jesus tells this parable, we read of a situation where Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to uh, prepare uh, to, to go to a village to find a place for them to stay. Uh, and it happens to be a Samaritan village. And it says this, the people did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. 
Jesus was not welcome in a Samaritan village because he was Jewish. Remember Jesus at the well? He encounters that woman who's a Samaritan, and he begins to talk to her, and she says, why are you doing this? People, Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans. We don't talk to one another. Samaritans, no good. Bad people. And Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of this story. One of those who wouldn't even welcome Jesus into their village. The Samaritan is the one who tends to the man, who takes personal responsibility, uses his own money, gets him to safety. And Jesus ends the story by asking the lawyer, who was the neighbor to this man who was left for dead? Did you see it? Jesus never answers the man's question. The question was, who's my neighbor? And Jesus turns it around and makes the issue, are you a neighbor? And Jesus ends the story by asking the lawyer who he thought the neighbor was. And the lawyer, again, he has the right answer. He says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do the same thing. Do the same thing as that Samaritan. That person you despise, that person you consider unclean, that person you don't think has any good in them. Do what he did. Go and show mercy. The Samaritan looked and he came near. Didn't play it safe. There was no guarantees what would happen to him, how it was going to end for him. You know, someone once said, love doesn't sound so dangerous until you've tried it. But, but though the Samaritan is, you know, he's a fictional character, he's still that enduring example for us, isn't he? And of so many others of what it means to show love and what it means to show mercy. We know the good Samaritan, as it's called. And Jesus implied that this Samaritan was loving God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength. The ability of our, the, the strength of our ability to love God depends on our ability to love others. And the ability to love others depends a lot on how we see them. We'll never be able to know who our neighbor is or be a neighbor until we lift judgments about people. We can't assume. We know what people are like. And prejudices often come, uh, keep us from loving people. And we all carry prejudices. I have prejudices in me. And these lead us, lead me to judge people sometimes and about what they're like or what I think they're like. <coughs> And uh, we have all kinds of, pre we have political prejudices. You know, our culture's running a special on these right now. You know, this person's on the far right. Oh, this person's woke. And so we just see them like that. And I won't go near them. We will not love that person because they're like this. They have this view. They think like this. We have social prejudices. We won't give ourselves to someone, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're here illegally because you never know, or, or, or we're not going to love that person because they appear homeless, or, or they're of this race, or they're of this ethnicity. We don't approve of that orientation. We don't like the way they parent. We don't like their family dynamics. They're always bickering. We have economic prejudices. That person's too rich. Look at the house they live in. Look at the car they drive. That person's too poor. Look at the house they live in. Look at the car they drive. And we can see people in these ways, or we can see people as created in the image of God. Doesn't mean it's not about agreement. It's not about seeing things or even approving of things, but it's seeing how God sees people, loved by God. And if we're going to love God, if I'm going to love God, I have to be willing to see what matters to the heart of God. People our world treats in, as invisible, oh, God sees very clearly. Only God can transform our hearts to see and respond to those who are very much seen by God, and they are on his radar. That Samaritan, 
is the one who recognizes that when it comes to the question of who is our neighbor, it might be anyone. There are no rules. Our neighbor, it turns out, is anyone in need that we find in our path. Our nation, our communities, our families, our world's just becoming more and more divided. We're becoming more tribal, and, and our suspicions and our preferences have just overtaken us. Large parts of the church, large parts of the Christian church have no idea how to put into practice what Jesus says when he says, love your neighbor. There are people who will use the name of God for power, even for violence. As the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be different. I want to be different. Because my allegiance is to him. Uh, Eli Weissel was a, a Jewish writer. He was a theologian. He was a Holocaust survivor. I think he won the Nobel Peace Prize, too. He tells the story of a woman named Maria. And uh, in the dark days of World War II when Weisel's family was living in Hungary and they knew it, it could just be a matter of time before the Nazis came and, and took their family away to the concentration camp, Maria was like a member of that family. Maria was a peasant woman. She was also a Christian. And during the early days of the war, she visited the Wiesel family, despite the social implications and what people would say. But then eventually, non-Jews were no longer allowed to go into the ghettos. Didn't stop Maria. She continued to find ways to get through the barbed wire, whatever barriers were there, and she would bring fruit or vegetables or cheese to the family. And then... One day she came to the door and she told them that uh, she had a little cabin up in the hills and that she wanted to take the children there where they would be safe, of which Eli at that time was one. She said, I want to hide them before the SS come. And the family decided after a lot of discussion that they were just going to stay together as the family, although they were deeply moved that, that Maria would do this. And this is what Eli Weissel writes about her later. Dear Maria, if other Christians had acted like her, the trains rolling toward the unknown would have been less crowded. If priests and pastors had raised their voices, if the Vatican had broken its silence, the enemy's hand would not have been so free. But most thought only of themselves. A Jewish home was barely emptied of its inhabitants before they descended like vultures. The Shema says to hear. And we are to hear that we are to love God and that we are to love him with all we are. And Jesus said that means loving your neighbor. Are we listening? And that lawyer who confronted Jesus would have said the Shema twice a day. He knew the scripture. He knew love your neighbor. Let's beware of knowing the Bible, but not acting on it. How we love may not take the courage and daring of a Maria. It's probably going to be a lot more ordinary in the things that come our way. But it's no less love. And I think it's amazing. I think one of the amazing things about this command to love your neighbor is that God is going to show his love through us. That he uses us. That he says, yep, I'm going to work through you to show my love to people. I'm not going to use angels. I'm not going to do necessarily anything supernatural. It's going to be you. I want to show my love through you. Isn't that a remarkable thing that he wants to love through us? Biblical spirituality is all about loving God. It's not only just, it's not just reading the Bible, it's not just praying, it's not just coming to church, but it's seeing other people, paying attention to other people, bringing food to someone who might be in need. It might be visiting a hurting family or, or making our way to the hospital or tutoring children who struggle in school or welcoming an immigrant or a, or, or a refugee or, or listening to someone who just needs to be listened to, doing acts of mercy to people who need mercy. We love God when we love our neighbor. Let's go. Let's do likewise. 
Let's pray. God of love, open our hearts to our neighbor, to the people next door and, and the people under our own roof, to, to, to those from here and those from faraway places, to children, to the elderly, to the person who just needs a break or a word of encouragement or an act of mercy. Help us to see you in the face of our neighbor and to know that as, as we love others, we're loving you. And it pleases you when we do this. And help us to do it with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. To the glory of the name of the one who loved us and gave his life for us, Jesus Christ. Amen.